Thank you. Hello, hello. Is the mic working? Yes. Uh, yep. Well, oh, perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Tejas, for the warm introduction. And yeah, so first talk today, let's see what's coming next to our favorite language. Uh, I had a slide introducing myself, but Tejas already did it. He just forgot one thing. I'm the Babel maintainer, uh, like the very cool JavaScript compiler. How many people here use Babel? Good, awesome, thank you everybody. I have stickers, so if you want stickers later, you can come to me and ask for one. Uh, and maybe you saw me online with that profile picture. I know it doesn't really look like me, but that's how I present myself on the web. It's a very old picture. Uh, and that was done. So, Tej just mentioned that I'm in this group called TC39. And before actually getting into like what are the new cool features for JavaScript, I want to spend a few minutes seeing how these features get get developed, how, uh, how JavaScript gets new syntax, new APIs. Uh, well, this happens in something called a standard body. Uh, standard bodies are like places where people try to agree with each other. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but this was like uh, Android 8, I guess. There was like a very big controversy about the Google burger emoji being wrong. Uh, like, well, you see, who puts the cheese at the bottom of your cheeseburger? Uh, and this doesn't really matter in practice. It like there was like there was news articles about this, and at some point the Google CEO himself had to say, "Okay, we're gonna fix the emoji." Uh, but like, how how do you decide what is the where is the right place to put the to put the cheese? Uh, well, there are these groups, uh, standard bodies, uh, where all of these decisions get uh, get made. Uh, some of them are relevant for for, for the web, uh, but like, there are standard bodies for like every single thing where companies might need to work together. Uh, so that if two companies are designing some, some product or are trying to develop some solution, and this solution needs to be able to speak with solutions from other companies, uh, a standard is the best way to ensure they can understand each other. Uh, and like we have Wattwig, where, for example, HTML is developed, or W3C, with many other web features, such as WebAssembly, uh, or like ITF, ECMA, where we work on JavaScript. There is Unicode that defines all like how how text is encoded, all of your emojis, and a lot of uh, data about translating like, numbers and formats in multiple languages. Uh, and in this group, there are these people meeting regularly, trying to, to figure out what's the best way to do something. Uh, I am in ECMA, where we have this group called TC39, uh, where it means Technical Committee 39. ECMA is many of these groups. This is, well, the 39th. We are at 55 right now, we're 54. Uh, and within this group, we define what the ECMAScript language is. Uh, does anybody here know why it's called ECMAScript and not JavaScript? Okay, uh, does anybody here work at Oracle? <laughs> uh, well, the reason is that Oracle registered JavaScript trademark 25 years ago, and they like, refused to release it to the public, so nobody is, allowed, is legally allowed to call something JavaScript other than themselves. Uh, Yep, so that's why we have ECMAScript instead. Uh, and like, who is in this group? Uh, like, who are those, those anonymous people that decide what's, what's the best language for all of us? Uh, oh, ignore those question marks, they should not be there. Uh, well, there are companies that implement the language, uh, like browser developers at Apple, Google, Mozilla, uh, that will have to implement the features and make sure that the features are features that can be implemented in a in a performant way that don't risk introducing bugs in browsers. There are companies using JavaScript, like Sony, Bloomberg, and many others. They're just, they're companies with many JavaScript developers, and so they want to make sure that the language is uh, what's best for their developer to be productive and to, to, to develop their product. And then there are university and uh, nonprofit organizations, like OpenJ, the OpenJS Foundation, where Node.js belongs. Uh, or, well, even Mozilla is a nonprofit organization. Uh, and then there are invited experts. Invited experts do not represent any company, but they, are, uh, they have a lot of knowledge on some specific topic. Uh, so we recently designed that daytime API, and there was like this person that had nothing to do with any of these companies, but he just knew a lot about how time works all across the world. And so this person gets invited to join this, to join this committee to, to make sure that actually we don't miss anything and we make all the right decisions. Uh, 
And they're also like normal JavaScript developers who just try to say, look, I, I write JavaScript for my projects. This is how the common JavaScript developer thinks. Um, and so we have all these people uh, that uh, try to do something. Like, how do they do it? Like, how do we, how do we decide? Uh, everything within this committee is based on having consensus, on full consensus, making sure that everybody agrees on, on, on everything that we're doing. This is because we have people with, a, like, as, as we saw, with a very wide range of backgrounds coming from, uh, from many different points of views. And so we have a system where everybody can say, no, this might look good for you, but from my point of view, uh, from where I come from, this is absolutely terrible. This should not be added to the language. And this makes sure that whenever we develop a new feature, we take into account every single concern, every single potential problem, and try to come up with actually the best. Uh, and we have uh, one driving principle that we absolutely will follow every single time, and that is don't break the web. Uh, the web is one of is a very old platform at this point. Uh, it's multiple decades old. And websites that were developed 10, 20, 25 years ago, they will still keep working in your browser. Uh, so whenever we design something, we must make sure that this doesn't break existing valid websites. Uh, and this can sometimes affect the, the way that features are designed. Uh, all of this happens on GitHub. You can follow all of this work. Uh, you can find repositories for the specification, for uh, language tests, for, for the various proposals, for uh, agendas or meeting notes to see what, what proposals have been discussed and what people think about those proposals. Uh, our spec is like hosted on GitHub. You could, if you feel brave, you could go and try reading through some parts of it. Uh, and this happens all year round. Uh, we have some sync meetings, like six meetings per year, where we, uh, we like approve features, uh, but the work has been done asynchronously on GitHub or in open calls where the community can join. Uh, it happens like weekly or even more frequently. Uh, and like in this framework, uh, how do we actually develop a new feature? Uh, we have a process uh, where proposals have to go through multiple stages. During these stages, we, we refine different aspects of the proposals until we have something ready to be merged into the language. Uh, and, well, uh, the stages have numbers. Uh, so the first one we have is stage one. Uh, stage one uh, is like, is when we when we see that there is like a common struggle in the ecosystem, that there is maybe uh, every developer has to install this library because the language is missing some capability. Or everybody has to write this very long code because the language doesn't give a better way of doing so that could be more, uh, more expressive and like, easier to follow. So during this, this first phase, it's where we, we try to explore what's the problem, and somebody in the community says, okay, I, I care deeply about this problem. I will make sure that the proposal, that, that I will be working on this proposal. I will make sure that all people interested will be, will, be, will be heard and that we can actually propose a solution. And like, we go look at what libraries on NPM do, what <coughs> other languages do. Like, did anybody else face this problem? Is there already a common solution that other communities agree on? Uh, and we try to figure out what is a, what is a possible solution for this problem. Uh, and at that point, we, we all meet. Uh, the, the champion of proposals says, uh, says, look, I did this research. I saw this, this, and this. Uh, I think this is somewhat a good design for what we could one day add to the language. And so the committee says, OK, uh, this seems good. The proposal can now go to stage two. Uh, and stage two is where you have a solution. Uh, the solution might not be complete. There are many details that still need to be filled. Uh, but it's where you can start seeing the API shape. And this is usually when people start talking about the proposal. And so you might heard, oh, there is this new cool feature at stage two. Uh, but just know that it's still very experimental. Everything can still change. Uh, but TC39 expects the feature to be eventually developed and added to the language. It's not guaranteed, but it's usually what happens. Uh, once we refine all of these minor details, so once we have a, a complete specification, uh, we go back to the committee and we say, look, uh, I think this is the best solution for this and this reason. And the, the committee, we all uh, have to agree, yes, this is indeed the best. 
and we can promote the proposal to stage 2.7. Uh, we are not apparently very good at counting, so we didn't remember what numbers comes after two. Uh, and the proposal is done at this point, and it can almost be implemented. There is just one problem, that just implementing things by reading a specification can be difficult. Uh, you might miss something, and there is no way to tell whether you missed something or not. So before telling browsers, go ahead, implement this, we need to sit down and write tests. Uh, we have a comprehensive test suite that checks every possible single edge case in the language. Uh, and so at this point, we're writing these tests, and as soon as they're done, the proposal can, oh, and you can also see like all browsers, how many of these tests pass. Ideally, you should all uh, target for 100%, uh, but there can be bugs or there can be proposals that are not implemented yet. So once the tests are written, uh, the, the committee gathers together and say, okay, browsers, it's now time to start implementing this. Uh, browsers will start implementing the proposal and might still find problems. Maybe the proposal is too complex to implement, so we need to maybe tweak some, tweak some keys uh, so that it can be, it can be fa implemented faster, uh, it can, like it can have better runtime performance, uh, or maybe it can avoid potential safety bugs. Uh, and also, they have to try shipping the proposal maybe in their, in their beta or nightly versions of the browser to make sure that it's web compatible, that indeed it does not break the web. Uh, and it happened multiple times that at this point, we figured out, okay, we thought everything was perfect, uh, but maybe Firefox shipped it in their, in their nightly version and it broke this website using this very old popular library. Uh, so we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to change the proposal so that uh, we can bring new features without breaking existing use cases. Uh, during this stage, uh, browsers will implement the proposal and will ship it at some point by default in the stable, uh, in the stable version. And once this is done, the proposal is actually considered finished. It will be promoted in stage four and it will be included in the next uh, edition of ECMAScript or of JavaScript. Uh, so usually when I propose stage four, even if it's not published in the spec yet technically, you can just consider it stable and it's like what you can already use day to day. Uh, well, unless you need your code to work in all the browsers if you're not using Babel. Um, okay, so we have this very long process that, uh, well, proposals have to graduate through all of these different stages and this can take years. Uh, like sometimes something very quick and takes maybe like one year or even I think the record was eight months. Uh, but we also have proposals that have been developed for the past 20 years. Uh, so seeing a proposal being uh, starting going through this stage tells you nothing about when it should actually be done. Uh, well, but we do get things done. Otherwise, uh, I wouldn't be there and there would be no reason for this committee to exist. Uh, so what is that is coming today in new, like in browsers? What is the new cool features that JavaScript have? Uh, well, yes 24 was approved yesterday morning, so this is officially the new version of the language. <laughs> and let's see what it contains. Uh, it's possible that many of you actually already saw these features because, as we saw, browsers have implemented them before them being added to the standard. So they've been around for already a couple of months. Um, so there are multiple Unicode-related utilities uh, to make sure that your, uh, your strings are like interoperable with other languages. Uh, you can check whether your strings have some properties that might otherwise be difficult to check if the browser doesn't provide built-in data for them. Uh, for example, have this new string is well-formed and well-formed uh, that checks whether your string is valid with it or not so that you know you can store it in your database or that, or that you know that if you pass it to some other service that will not break due to the well, to the invalid encoding. And we need this because, as you may know, JavaScript uses UTF-16, uh, which is a very weird way of encoding characters. Because, uh, like, well, UTF-16 uses 16 bits to encode, to encode characters, but sometimes it's not enough. For example, you have this smiley emoji that looks like a single character, uh, and it is a single Unicode character, but JavaScript has to represent it using two two separate pieces because it needs more than 16 bits. And so your string, which actually contains first a character that like DA3D, followed by this DE0A. And these are called UTF-16 surrogates. They must always go together. Uh, and if you do not, your string will not be 
compatible with other systems. So if you're missing one of those two, for example, your database might crash when you try to save this there. Uh, and so like, this is where this is well from utility comes. And then there is a too well from utility that will just uh, remove the, the, the invalid pieces in your string. Uh, and we have a new flag for uh, regular expressions that's able to uh, use this like slash p syntax to test for properties of strings. JavaScript already had a way of testing for properties of characters, so you could ask, is this character ASCII? Is this character uh, a number in any language? And now this extended to also test for strings. Uh, for example, here we have this little family that looks at a single character, but actually is a string containing like seven characters. Uh, and now we can also like easily say, okay, do I have an emoji? And even if an emoji is not a single character, our regex will be able to to, to say yes. Uh, and this new flag also supports set operations on regular expressions. So we could like say, do we have an ASCII character, but excluding numbers from zero to nine, we can do set intersection and, and union and like the, well, I think symmetric difference, all the standard set operations. Mm, so that was one. Uh, we have different new utilities for working with raw memory and with multi-threading. Uh, so when you use web workers to try to split work across multiple threads to make your web app faster. Uh, there is a new atomics.wait async. Uh, there was already atomics.wait that lets you block your thread until when some other thread is done computing some result. Uh, and with wait async, you can wait, easily wait for the other thread without having to actually block. And we just return a promise that's resolved as soon as this other thread is done with, with whatever it was computing. We have resizable, resizable uh, array buffers and global shared array buffers. So you can, if you're working with a raw chunk of memory, you're maybe trying to code some data into it. If you figure out, oh, this is not enough, uh, you can now re resize them. Uh, and you can now transfer array buffers across threads. Uh, so until before this proposal, if you had some chunk of memory, uh, maybe that you read from the cell system, that you get from some like, IO operation, uh, the only way to post, pass it to a different thread, if it was not shared, was to just clone it, which means that you have one megabyte of data, the, the, your runtime, your browsers will have to go and copy all of these bits for the whole megabyte of new thread, and now you can just transfer them as is by, by passing ownership to the other thread. And this, this greatly helps improving performance in, in like this type of multi-thread applications. Uh, and all of these things are available already in most browsers. Uh, if you if you don't, well, except for like, we can see two of them are not yet available on Firefox, uh, but they're being implemented, they will be available soon. So if you're only targeting new browsers or if you are using polyfills, you'll be able to likely use this very soon. Uh, and we have other convenience methods like object.groupby, map.groupby uh, that, well, lets you group arrays by some category. Uh, like if I have these arrays of people with the country they live in, uh, I could like group them by country and I get this like object with saying in Italy I have these uh, items of the array, in Germany I have these other items. Uh, and this is actually, this proposal is a very great example for what it means to not break the web. Uh, this is a very API. Usually you would have an array method, uh, an array with like dot something you call the method on it. Originally the proposal was array.prototype.goodbye, uh, but we shipped that. And we figured out there was some old version of some very popular library. Maybe it was MooTools or Prototype.js, I'm not sure at this point. Uh, and that just broke. And this means that websites that were still using that library that was popular 15 years ago, they were like not working anymore. So we had to go back to the drawing board and figure out, okay, how do we change this? And so we, we moved the method to be a static method on object. Uh, and the map.rubai method does the same, but returns a map rather than an array. Uh, and we have promise with resolvers that uh, gives you a different way of creating promises that might be useful when interacting with some non-promise based APIs. It returns the promise and, the fun and separately functions to resolve and reject it. Uh, that was it for ES2024, uh, but we also already have some ES2025 features. Uh, these features have been approved. Uh, so we, appro we approved ES2024 yesterday. Uh, but the deadline for adding new features is uh, 60 days before. So for features approved after deadline, they need to wait until the next Segma Suite version. Uh, but we just added new uh, utility methods from working with sets. Uh, so you can do, for example, an intersection between two sets 
uh, to know that, well, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 5, the intersection is 1, 3. Because like sets were introduced in ECMAScript 6, or ECMAScript 2015, that was, well, almost 10 years ago. And until now, the only thing you could do with sets was adding elements to them and checking whether they already contain an element or not. And so this gives all the common operations that like, basically all other languages provide uh, when working with sets. And again, uh, these are already available in browsers. Uh, they're available in the latest version of browsers, so if you need to support more versions, you might need to wait a bit. Uh, but you will be able to use them very soon. Uh, th does anybody here already use any of these new features? Great. Uh, good. Well, it's good that it's not been used yet, because like, ideally, not all of your users are on the, on the latest Chrome or Safari version. OK, uh, so this is what's coming now. But what about the future? Uh, we have all of these proposals, so what can you expect uh, JavaScript to have in the next two years, five years, or maybe even 10 years? Uh, so we have something like, I think, 70 proposals. Not all of them will be added to the language, and it would be impossible for me to go through all of them now. Probably need like, a full day at least. So I just picked a few of them based on what I'm personally excited about. But if you have your favorite proposals, uh, if you want to just a status update about one of them, I would be very happy for you to just come to me and say, hey, I was promised this in JavaScript features five years ago. Why is it not there yet? Uh, so, OK, well, what, what am I excited about that's coming next to JavaScript? Uh, one of my favorite proposals, it's a stage three. So it's almost done. It's just waiting for implementation to have shipped for long enough. And it's import, well, it's actually two proposals, import attributes and JSON imports that when used together, they allow you to just have a JSON file somewhere and directly import it from your, from your JavaScript. Uh, this is actually being shipped under a different syntax. It originally used the assert keyword and not the with keyword, both in Node and in Chrome, uh, I think one or two years ago. So might of you have, some of you might have already been using it. Just be careful that this old assert keyword, uh, it was just experimental uh, for reasons we figure out that actually we do not want a search semantics here. So both Chrome and Node shipped it. So if you were using it, make sure to go there and update your code to use with. Uh, and like this lets you directly import JSON in browser without having to go through a bundler, like through some sort of JSON loader or some, or having to manually fetch and then parse uh, your JSON file. Uh, this is already implemented in Chrome and Safari with the new syntax. It's been implemented in Firefox, so this will hopefully be part of the next version of the language and will be hopefully uh, restaged for in the next few months. Uh, another stage three proposals I'm personally excited about is temporal. Uh, and this is actually not implemented anywhere yet. Uh, because, well, stage three is when implementations have to start implementing proposals, but that might take time. Uh, I know that, for example, uh, V8, uh, the the JavaScript engine within Chrome, so maintained by Google, uh, has been implementing this proposal for, I think, close to one year, and they're still uh, not ready to ship it. Uh, this is both because the proposal was complex to implement, and because while implementing it, we kept finding like, problems uh, discovered thanks to implementation, and so we had to like, cycle between implementations and the people designing this proposal to make sure it was in the best state possible. And this proposal gives you a new way of using uh, date, time, data in JavaScript. We already had the new date API, but it was, uh, who likes here the new date constructor? Well, uh, obviously nobody likes it. It's like these weird things where like days start from one and months start from zero or the other way around, and you cannot actually do much with it. Uh, this new temporal API is the most comprehensive date API among like all programming, built-in API among all programming languages. And there are other languages already taking a look at our proposal to see if they can implement the same. And it lets you uh, use, uh, well, dates and times, uh, time zones. You can check how things work in other parts of the world. Uh, there are instants in like a universe timeline. There are durations. You can do operations with a lot of things. So for example, we could say, oh, I have my flight at 11.55 uh, tomorrow in Hong Kong. And my flight is 775 minutes long. Uh, when I arrive to Budapest, what time will it be uh, in, in the local time? And like you can do all of these types of operations. You don't have to worry about uh, what calendar system they use in, in Japan uh, or what 
time zone is in the IN because the language knows lots of this and takes care of you for all the various edge cases. So you can actually focus on your logic and your date time computations will likely work with users from all over the world. Another purpose I'm excited about, this is just a stage two. So this is very experimental. It's not close to be implemented everywhere. It can still change a lot, but I'm very hopeful that this will happen one day. It's module declarations. Uh, it gives us a way of having multiple modules all within the same file. Uh, and it basically gives a very easy target for bundlers to actually put our modules in one file. Uh, so they don't have to implement the whole semantics of, of how ECMAScript models work. Uh, I know there are a couple of people working on bundlers here, and like, I know that like, properly implementing namespaces and top-level await when bundling can be very challenging. And my hope is that this proposal will actually let people uh, ship native ESM to the browser. Uh, well, right now, well, we are shipping native ESM, but like, we, are, we have to re-implement all of it in our tools because we cannot really just rely on the browser implementation. Uh, and like, well, you can have a decent model that all import each other. And and this will hopefully solve the problem of, well, I cannot just use native ESM because I need to fetch a thousand files, and that's going to take five minutes while my user is trying to interact with my app. And continuing, going to even lower stages, so things are even more experimental, and maybe we will actually decide, no, this is a bad idea, no, it's not worth to do it, or uh, what we have is already good enough. Uh, but like a problem that we're working on right now is that JavaScript, numbers in JavaScript can be weird. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw this meme where like, people say, oh, JavaScript numbers are broken. Doesn't even know how to do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. Uh, this is not JavaScript's fault. This is how it works in basically every programming language. It's just how floating point numbers works. Uh, because like, computers usually think in base 2. And in base 2, it's impossible to like, properly say 0 0.1 or 0 0.3. So you have to run them, and you get weird things like the fact that just adding two numbers doesn't work according to how we humans expect this to work. Uh, so we're exploring a new number type called decimal uh, that lets us express numbers in base 10, which is how people think about numbers. Uh, so we might have a decimal 0 0.1 plus a decimal 0 0.2 that is actually equal to decimal 0 0.3. And this can be handy where you have like computations with uh, like with financial data or where you, need, uh, where you need your numbers to be, to have the precisions that people expect rather than the precision that computers expect. Or it can be useful when interacting with other systems that already do support this type, like most database systems already support a decimal type, or C++ does, I think also Python does. Uh, and so this will make it easier for your JavaScript app to interact with, like with your server or with whatever other language it has to interact with. And Finally, uh, another proposal that I'm very excited about is intel.message format. Intel is this, uh, this API uh, in JavaScript. Uh, it stands for internationalization. Uh, it provides us utilities to localize all of our content. So for example, you might have a date, and a date might be like, like for example, January 1st, 2024 might be, well, that's a bad example. January 2nd, 2024 might be or two slash one slash twenty twenty four in some countries, but it might be twenty twenty four dash o one dash two is some other. And a developer cannot just know how to format the date, date in all possible languages based on where their customers are. Uh, and so this Intel API is what lets the browser expose to the web developer the tools that they need uh, to properly localize all of their or their of their content. And message format is where you can actually use to have translations. Uh, so we might say, I, I, my apps need to show notification count somewhere. And the way this notification count is shown, uh, I, I need to have a slightly different format depending on the number of notifications. Like if it's zero, you have no new notification. Uh, then I have a different format for one. Then for other numbers, I have to add the S in English at the end of notifications. And every language has their own rules. Like some languages have more than one plural. Uh, and like, there can be slight differences between all of them. And so 
with this API, we could have our message in English with English rules. We can pass this to our translator that maybe they will translate it to, to Hungarian or to, to Italian, to, to Japanese. Uh, and then with this Intel message format API, we can just load the translated messages, tell the browser, look, I have this message that is in English. Please uh, replace our variable count with the value one and give me whatever I have to show in our UI. And this is, again, incredibly useful when you have uh, a wide variety of customers and I speak different languages and I come from different cultures. Uh, so I'm very hopeful that this will make its way to the language. Uh, it will take long. Uh, I think within the committee, people generally like the idea, uh, but it still needs a lot of time to be sure it's the right thing. Uh, there are still many, many areas that need to be explored. There are still many questions that need to be answered. So like proposals like this will likely take very long. We're, like, we're, we're very long means not like two years, but maybe we're talking about five or 10 years. And that was it. And like, I've been talking a lot about what, what we do in this group. Uh, but I said at the beginning that actually it's not just like a closed group. We, we have like uh, these regular calls, regular interactions with like tool authors or JavaScript developers or uh, educators that teach how to use JavaScript for other people. So how can you get involved? We need help all over the place. We need to write these tests for proposals to make sure they're correct. Uh, we need feedback from people that look at our proposals and say, uh, I was hoping to use this proposal for this thing, but it seems like it doesn't actually work in this case. So maybe you can take this into account. Uh, or you can write blog posts, articles, trying to teach people about new proposals that are coming so that everybody uh, can learn how these new JavaScript features work. Uh, and I would, if anybody wants to, to has feedback about anything, wants to help about anything, I would be very happy to talk with all of you. And that's it. Uh, thank you all for, for listening to me. What, what an incredible talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Give it up, everybody! <laughs>